We must. We must. We must increase our bust. We must. We must. We must increase our bust. Hello, mortals. I am the booktube goddess, the number one drag queen booktuber on YouTube. After reading the books for A.G. McDonald's Cancelathon Readathon, I have found the secret of how to avoid being canceled. <laughs> Let me say this again. If someone comes for you on Twitter or social media, I have the secret on how to immunize yourself from being canceled. But before I tell you the secret, let's go over the books I read for the Cancelathon. The first prompt I did was, won't somebody think of the children? And the book I read was, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, by Judy Bloom, published in 1970. This book regularly makes the list of one of the most banned books in school libraries at least in the United States. And some of the stated reasons why it was banned include it was sexually offensive and immoral, anti-Christian, profane, and offensive. So you know this book must be really bad. Margaret, this 12-year-old main character, must be a piece of work. Obviously, she is the middle school whore of Babylon, coming to corrupt our innocent youth. So let's review some of the filthy pornographic shenanigans of this middle school sex pot. There is a lot of discussion about menstruation. One girl, now brace yourself for this one, she lied about getting a period to impress her friends. Can you believe that? <laughs> Further, there is talk about, I don't even know how I can say this without fainting. They talked about hairs growing down there. Margaret and her friends talked about kissing boys and it gets much, much worse because there is a scene, a party. I won't call it an orgy, but there was a game called Spin the Bottle and Margaret actually kissed a boy twice. My goodness, this Jezebel, her father even had issues of Playboy. Finally, finally, there is a satanic chant. I will reenact it for you but I'm warning you, hide your children. Hide your pets. Turn this video off if you are weak of heart. We must. We, we must, must. We must increase our bust. We must. We must. We must increase our bust. We must. We must. We must increase our bust. And worst of all, what makes me really break out in a cold sweat? Margaret moves to the suburbs of New Jersey. <laughs> okay, the story itself, the actual plot of the story, is Margaret's struggle with her belief in God. Her father is Jewish, her mother is Christian, so she goes on a journey to synagogues and churches to find out how or where she can be closer to God. Oh, in my research, I also found out that the novel was actually rewritten. Well, one little phrase was rewritten by the author, Judy Bloom. She updated the mechanics of putting on a sanitary pad to make them have adhesive strips to apply to your underwear. In the original story, they attach to sanitary belts, but since those aren't used anymore, Judy Bloom decided to modernize the story. So. Okay, I give this book my blessing. It is very short, simple, and extremely well-written. It's one of those first-person books that just seem effortless. The second prompt was, don't subtweet, passive-aggressively subtweeted, read a book that has sparked a drama. 
And like many people in this readathon, I read the debut novel by Emily Wen Zhao, Blood Air, the first novel in a trilogy. Now, this was a really hyped series. Zhao got a six figure advance, which is huge for a debut novel. And people were talking about it as the next Ember in the Ashes series, which I actually liked. It's set in a Russian-inspired fantasy world. The main character is Princess Anastasia, who is exiled and in hiding. But don't jump to the conclusion this is a retelling of the Romanov Anastasia story, because it is not. It's really a traditional fantasy. So why was it canceled? The first charge was that it took a line from Tolkien, Don't go where I can't follow, which Sam says to Frodo, and Anna, Princess Anastasia, says to a dying friend. So is that really plagiarism? I don't think so. It's one line. It doesn't actually seem that unique to me. There's also the charge that she was copying a scene from The Hunger Games where Katniss sang to Rue as she dies and is buried in some flowers, something like that. I mean, really, I've seen much worse that has been gotten away with by authors, being inspired by other authors. But of course, the biggest complaint was that the novel was racist or insensitive to the history of slavery in the United States. And I got nothing. The story centers around people born with magical ability called Affinites who are subjugated, enslaved by an empire. So yes, I guess if you squint really hard, you can read parallels into slavery in the United States. But personally, I don't understand why it would be offensive, even if it was a huge metaphor. That said, Emily Zhao issued a long apology and she pulled her book from publication. Of course, it's published now, but it was released like six months after it was originally scheduled to be released. Now, putting all that aside, what did I think of the book itself? Let me say I thought it was very well written. It is as well written as most young adult fantasies I find out there. I want to emphasize that I thought it was a really well written novel. but. The story wasn't for me personally. One, the magic system was not explained enough for me. Anna is what is called a blood affinite, so she could manipulate people's blood. But it seemed like the only thing she did with it was to telekinetically move blood. Since they were flesh affinites, people who could control flesh, I didn't really get why blood was more special than flesh, besides being rare. And I kept waiting for her to be able to maybe cool blood or bring down fevers or warm blood if she, temperatures were really cold or even simply clean blood off of clothes. But no, she just used her powers to graphically kill people. So I just wasn't impressed by the magic system, but it was far removed from something like Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn series where the magic system was so well developed that it was just amazing to read. But that wasn't the main thing that bothered me. The main thing for me was that I did not like the main character, Anna. I found her so frustrating. She was constantly barging headfirst into situations which were obviously stupid. So. I couldn't help but question her intelligence. And I know maybe it's just me, but she kept doing it over and over again, and I got very frustrated with her. I just did not like her as a main character. So I am going to zap this book. Again, it's not a bad book by any means. It's, again, well-written, and I can understand why some people really like it. But personally, I didn't like the magic system. I didn't like the main character. So the book wasn't for me, and it's not something I'm going to recommend, and I don't see myself picking up the sequel. So this brings us to the last prompt in the cancel -a -thon, 
which is the group read, so you'll have publicly been shamed by John Ronson. Now, I've been trying to get into audiobooks, and I think I made a mistake getting this as an audiobook. First, the audiobook is narrated by the author, and he has a Welsh accent, which I'm not used to, but there's something about his voice. The cadence of his voice was really repetitive, and it got on my nerves after a while. But most of all, this is probably the type of book that I would have liked to have bookmarks and notes. And I'm just not used to doing that in an audiobook. I'm not even sure how to do it. I think there's a way. And I really wanted to read the bibliography, and I couldn't do that because it was an audiobook. So what about the book itself? This is a book of anecdotes about people who were publicly shamed on Twitter and social media most of whom lost their reputations or their jobs or both. Sometimes it seemed warranted that they were canceled, like writer Jonah Lair, which is discussed a lot. He fabricated quotes in a nonfiction book, and that kind of seems like something that should kill the career of a journalist. But you do feel sorry for him, and John Ronson presents him as sympathetically as possible, I think. Then there's some really crazy examples, like Lindsay Stone, who posted a tasteless photo shouting and flipping off in front of the uh, sign Silence and Respect in the Arlington National Cemetery. And if you don't know that cemetery, it's a cemetery for military veterans. Now, she wasn't a journalist, and she wasn't in the public eye. This was just a personal Facebook post that was supposed to be a joke. Like she posted a picture of herself smoking in front of a non-smoking sign. But social media got a hold of it and she was publicly shamed, losing her job, and basically her life was ruined. Now, keep in mind, this book is a collection of anecdotes. There was little scientific studies backing up his thesis that public shaming is the worst form or one of the worst forms of punishment from a mob that any individual can suffer. Ronson also throws around the term evil a lot, which I think is kind of problematic. And rather than backing up his theories, he quotes people who aren't necessarily experts unless it hang there as fact. And I wish I could give examples, but I have an audiobook and I don't really want to try to listen through it all again to give examples. But that aside, putting all that aside, this was really an interesting book, and I'm glad I read it. And I give it my blessing. I think it would be an enlightening book for anyone to read who is on or has experience in social media. And I found out it even inspired a Black Mirror episode. Now, this book has the answer to how avoid being canceled or publicly shamed. I'm not sure if this will always work, but he provides one case where it did. Max Mosley, the president of the International Automobile Federation, which oversees Formula One and other racing events, he was publicly shamed by having a video released or pictures released where he was role-playing Nazi sex fantasies with female prostitutes. And it did not help that his father was a famous fascist in the 30s. Anyway, how did he not only survive the public shaming, but he became a hero and won a court battle. How did he not get canceled? Here is his big secret, and here's how you can fight back if someone tries to cancel you. Are you ready for it? The secret is not to feel shame. That's it. If someone calls you out, you should not apologize or at least not appear weak if you do apologize, and to fight back. Now, I've seen this play out on YouTube. I'm sure there are exceptions to the rule, but mostly I see when people are canceled and then make an apology or reaction, the ones who appear weak are the ones who are truly canceled. The ones who are angry, even if it's angry at themselves, or if they are indignant, but remain strong or appear strong, people will rally behind them. The ones who cry or try to seek sympathy in any way, that's like spilling blood in the water, attracting the sharks. 
Case in point, if you don't follow the beauty community, I don't really want to get into the actual event, but there's something called Dramageddon, where a group of beauty influencers were canceled and there were some big names. But the only one who came out on top was this guy, Gabriel Zamora, who ironically started the entire drama. But he made a kick-ass video that had everyone rallying around him. He was not apologetic. He just came out swinging. Let's keep it 100. I'm tired of this narrative being put out that someone is so sweet and someone is so good. When behind the scenes, I know so much more. And I'm going crazy because this image is being painted out and it's being well received as, you're good. Now there were two others who made apologies where they cried and they were viciously canceled. Laura Lee and Manny MUA. And they never have really recovered from it. strong all the time and I want you guys to know that it's okay to not be strong all the time too you know I feel like being vulnerable is also a, a, a sign of I'm sorry oh, God. there's other examples Shane Dawson has made a couple of apology videos in his hundred years on YouTube and guess what he never appears weak Sometimes he even appears angry when he's making an apology video. Record a song with me, made two videos with her. She got hundreds of thousands of subscribers overnight because of you guys, but also because of the video that I made with her. And they're flipping that on me saying I'm a pedophile because I helped someone. Fuck you. And I think that's what saved him. And he's still one of the biggest names on YouTube. But the best example is James Charles, who was canceled in, some people call it Dramageddon 2. But forget about the facts. Just to prove my point, he had two apology videos. The first one, he made a tearful apology and he appeared weak. And he ended up losing a record 3 billion subscribers. No matter what is anybody is saying or commenting or talking about, Mom, I need you to know that you're the most important person in my life. Again, it doesn't matter what the facts are. I'm just telling you it doesn't matter. It's all about the optics. Because he then released a second video where he came out swinging. In the second video, he looked strong and aggressive and unapologetic. And guess what? He gained his subscribers back. And now millions and millions of people have weighed in with their opinions and speculations on subjects that they honestly know absolutely nothing about. I will not ask for sympathy and I will definitely not ask for forgiveness either. Hello, what does that tell you? So one wonders what would have happened if Emily Zhao never apologized for blood air? What if she aggressively defended it? What if she rode the controversy to publication and attacked her accusers as trolls? I don't know. Let me know down in the comments what you think would have happened. Please give this video a thumbs up, and if you aren't a subscriber, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. It really means a lot. Until next time, may all the books you read be blessed. Yeah.